Comment on the Doomed Week videos for your chance to win the rulebook. We will choose three winners, one from the YouTube comments, one from OnTabletop.com, and our Cult of Games members get an extra chance to win. Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I'm joined once again by Chris McDowell, the author of The Doomed, and we're going to be having a little chat about game design. Uh, but before we get into The Doomed itself, uh, I thought it would be interesting to find out where you started from uh, and how you ventured into both the hobby and game design, because I, f I feel like there's a lot of similarities in your approach between previous RPGs and The Doomed. Um so I mean, are we, are we going all the way back to getting into the hobby? You, you can go as far back as you would like to. Chris. I'll give you the abridged version, um, lest we be here all day. Um, so the um, the abridged version is I got into um, sort of like so many people in this country. I think my, my way into the hobby was through Warhammer and Games Workshop games mm -hmm. uh, when I was about 10 years old. And at the time, um, I liked the idea of those games much more than the reality of playing them a lot of the time. So I loved collecting the little miniatures. I loved reading through the books and the magazines and looking at these, these great layouts um, and these dioramas and stuff like that and, and sort of getting immersed in the world and thinking about, well, what, what, who could be my guys? Who am I going to put in my army? Um, but then the, the the playing of the game was often a bit of an anticlimax and a bit of a, a bit of a slog. So mm -hmm. um, I started to then sort of gravitate more towards skirmishy games. This is when Necromunda came out, mm -hmm. um, the first version of Necromunda, and um, and then also kind of going into RPGs as well. And um, and again with RPGs, I was kind of hitting a little bit of frustration of being very enchanted by the idea of RPGs and you know these games where you can do anything and anything might happen. And you've got mm. all this kind of chaos in there, um, but then often feeling kind of bogged down by a lot of rules. So later on, I started to work on my own systems, um, including RPGs and, and a little bit of uh, miniature games as well. And yeah, that eventually sort of, well, this is like 20 years later, would become uh, a game called Into the Odd, which was the RPG uh, that I designed and released, the first one that I sort of released. <laughs> Um, followed up by Electric Bastion Land, which was sort of a related game. And the idea with that was to make something that was incredibly simple, incredibly stripped back. And, and lots of games say that, but I wanted to really push how far can you actually go at removing bits of these systems and removing things that should be there yeah. and still have a game that works. What's the, the phrase writers use? You have to kill your darlings. Yeah, absolutely. And the idea of, of stripping back as much as you can from a rule set. I often see almost horror in people's eyes when I start doing that. Like we'll be playing a new game and a rule will say X and I go, well, that doesn't really make sense for us. Or, or why, so I just go, well, we'll not, we'll not use it anymore. And if I'm doing that at a club, my opponent is fine with it because we've, we've been playing and there's a lot of back and forth in our gaming, but you can mm. often see uh, maybe some of the younger players or, or people who are heavily invested in specific games and they think, but you, you can't just, strip that rule out but that rule is important for a reason you're going that rule that rule is an in, uh, impediment to our play and to our enjoyment so that rule's going mm. away now um, i think it's um it's it's like if you were opening up like the code of a video game and just deleting lines obviously mm. that would presumably break the game if you didn't know what you were doing but i think yeah that some people still think that approach carries across to like tabletop games as well but yeah. there's a lot more wiggle room for just removing something and like you say, removing a bit of friction. And, and so, I mean, Into the Odd is a remarkably interesting game, but I, I, I could see there when I looked at Into the Odd and then looked at The Doomed, clearly fast play and, and rules light seems to be uh, very much a, a go-to for yourself. Yeah, so, and I think I think it kind of comes out of a sense of impatience. As you can tell by the fact I interrupted your question yeah, before you were like, finished yeah. asking the question. But I think it, it comes from impatience at a couple of things. And some of that is, you know, wanting to get to the good bit of the game straight away. And by the nature of like the, the friends that I play with, I'm usually the person bringing the new game to the table and saying, right, do you want to mm -hmm. try this game? And sort of convincing them to try it. And then I have to sit and explain the game to them. And I just want that bit gone as, as quickly as possible because I don't think anyone enjoys that bit, but I find that bit especially 
sort of exasperating even if, even if my friend is really like committed to it yeah um it can it can just feel like such a painful process to, to go through that so it's a lot of it is designed to just get the game running as like you say as quickly as possible and then when the game starts getting to the fun bit of the game as, as quickly as you can yeah because whenever whenever we look at uh, the doom then there is essentially one stat people have a quality yes and everything works off that quality and and even when you bring modifiers in they are capped at a plus or minus one to that quality rule which seems like it it's almost too light um mm. the, the, you, people expect there to be more uh levels of of iteration between things you you've got to have degrees of complexity to make a, an interesting game um but having played through the doom because there's so much going on it helps the game flow that you're not even worried about how far you're moving you're going well i should be able to move about that far uh, unless your opponent's going i think you're extracting the urine there with that run um but but it, it helps the game flow and, and evolve and adapt like that did you start with the idea of of only having singular stat or did you start with more ideas and then and then through play testing or, or the like sort of strip it back or so when i very first started without the core of the system um there, were, there was a lot of similarity actually with um the one page rules games because they have um two stats they have like i think is it called quality even yeah. then they have quality and uh, defense i think um, but basically they have the one for attacking and the one for defending yeah. and i saw that as a challenge because i thought well if this rules like game has two could we not just put them together and then have have other ways to differentiate units um and yeah like, like i've said before i always i always try and push things as far as i can but the, the important thing that goes with that is knowing when you've gone too far because um it'll often be the case that i'm testing something and i'll think well what if i just remove that and then you try it and it just doesn't work so you need to put that thing back in so yeah. the, the 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 way that i describe it is kind of taking bits of the machine off until the machine starts to fall apart and then you put that last piece back in so that it's just holding together <laughs> and then uh and then it's like right that's done that's perfect um ramshackle yeah, banger that's it and like you said that the, about the modifiers and things like that when i was looking at the kind of complexity that i wanted to remove it kind of boiled down to three things mm -hmm. um you said about modifiers um so i i love classic battle tech but playing through that game there's a lot of starting with a target number and adding okay well i add plus two for this minus one for this plus three for that and that's fine especially for those of us who kind of grown up playing these games yeah but it's just another thing to teach people and it's another thing that slows the game down and it, it's it's part of your brain that is running that system and it isn't thinking about what's actually happening at the board so like, like you said i i I initially did have it down as just like, well, there's a plus one and a minus one to every type of role. So if you're shooting, maybe you get plus one for this, minus one for that. Yeah. But then I've gone even further and now there's only one singular modifier. So it's either a plus one or a minus one. So if you're shooting, it's minus one if they're in cover and that's it. Mm -hmm. And and like you say, you do get people that say like, oh, well, th th there should be like, there should be a long range modifier because we're shooting at long range. So it should be minus one. And th there's so many games that have all that. Like, I, I, I'm not saying that's, that this is the right way and that's the wrong way to play, but I, sure. I wanted a game that threw a lot of those assumptions out the window and said, well, no, stop, don't worry about that. Let's just, it's more about focusing on positioning and making sure you're getting a clean shot on the target. And that's all you kind of need to worry about really for your shooting role. Well, I suppose uh, because there are other games out there that already have them, you don't want to just be attempting to publish a reskinned version, you know, you're the doomed version of x y or z and uh, yeah you want to have that's, something that actually stands on its own feet mm, and that's the thing with um so another game that was a big inspiration was um frostgrave mm. um and reading through that there was so much stuff where i thought oh, i really like that i really like that but there's no point trying to make a new frostgrave because i like it because it's a good game yeah. um I, you know if I, I i might do house rules if i was running it because that's just the nature of these games yeah but there's there's no point just trying to make like you say your own version of something that exists unless you're going to do it differently. I always think because the the relative game mechanics are are so simple, you know, no no measuring for range, no measuring for movement, a single stat and, and maybe a single modifier. Um, it means that the rules themselves. This is a, a relatively big book. Uh, I'm going to say it's almost 200 pages. Is it 170? Yeah, 178 yeah. pages, I think. Yeah, well, I'm not including the covers. Um, ah, yeah. <laughs> but 
when people look at a book that size, uh, they'll either expect it to be absolutely stuffed full of background and world building and lore or stuff filled with rules. Um, and, and you've decided to buck that trend by not having a load of world building. It's a very, uh, as we've discussed already, a very open world and open realm to play in. Uh, and then the rules are so small you could get them onto, I was going to say two sides of an A4, but I think they actually fit onto half of an A4 page on one side. So you can just hand somebody a card and go, this is how the game plays. But the bulk of this book is um, devoted to the horrors, the conflicts, the scenarios that you're going to be playing, um, which often when you, you get a, a, a new rule book in, it will have six scenarios or maybe if you're lucky, 10 or 12 scenarios. They're, they're very, um, I wouldn't say an afterthought, but there's not as much time devoted to them. Uh, yeah, whereas here you've really gone deep into that aspect of it. Uh, was that just uh, the nature of the beast because because the game is so narrative driven that you you had to f focus more on on this creation side of it? So it came from a few directions really, and one of them was um, there's a book that I I really I really recommend this book if you're interested at all in game design because I think it does something really interesting. Even if I don't know if I recommend the game itself, um, it's called One Hour War Games by Neil Thomas, mm. and it has a very simple like two page set of rules for initially it's like classical warfare um and all those rules fit on two pages and that they're about as basic as you can imagine it's like you move this far and you you cause this much damage to the unit if you're attacking with a unit um but then the rest of the book is applying that rule set to different eras and then like a huge set of scenarios at the back so the thing i liked about that is it had a very simple the rules were so little of what made that book exciting that like that made me want to think, well, maybe I could run a game in the Pike and Shot era, even though I've never really been interested in that era because I've got a very simple rule set here. And there's a load of scenarios at the back uh, that you can kind of use to for, for different eras. And it talks about how to apply them. And that might seem like an odd fit because that's a it's a very historical kind of thing. But I I often find that with games that are very simple, it, it sometimes lacks the support to tell you actually what to do with that simplicity. So you can make a very simple rule set, put it on two sheets of paper and put it out as a PDF and say, here's my really simple hmm. um, rule system. But unless you have something, unless you tell the people what to actually do with it, I think it's it's not going to get people excited to actually to use it. It's, yeah. it's not in aid of anything. So yeah, I wanted to have a huge list of scenarios and the scenarios are split into two halves as well. So like you say, there's the horror and the uh, the conflict are the two halves of the scenario. So you're mixing and matching between these 36 things. So someone can do 36 times 35 and tell me the, no, 36 times 36 and tell me the, <laughs> the combinations, but theoretically, effectively infinite number of combinations of scenarios. Um, and like you say, the, the, those horrors as well are where a lot of the, some of the complexity comes back in. Hmm. So because the rules are so simple and light, it's an opportunity to have these more complex enemies where if you have an already complex system and then you have complex units, for me, that's too much because it's like my brain can just about run the game. Yeah. And then you insert this monster that breaks all the rules. And I, I, I struggle with that. But here, each of the horrors does kind of break the rules in some way or the other. So it, 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 it works for me because the, the core is so simple. Yeah. And it's interesting because when we get to the horrors, in most beastries, you would get um, a few lines, X, Y, and Z. Here's what the monster is. Here's its stat line. But really, I, I feel like the um, the horror section in particular uh, really shows what's going on on the tabletop because you have the, the little description, the devourer's stats, for example. You know, he, he has his claws, he has his acid, and he gets to move when he shoots. That's all happy. Then you also have the minions, how they interact. Then you have the nexuses, uh, which we've not really talked about, but um, they're they're like the tethers, the anchor, the the horrors to this reality, uh, and they have to be removed before the horror can actually be um, taken out on the the tabletop. And every time you take out nexus, it does something. It may buff the other nexus, buff the horror, buff the minions, move things around. There, there's layers of complexity there. And like you say, it's it's because you have such a, a um, slick 
simple set of core mechanics that you can put the added detail in here. I assume that the likes of the, the horror list uh, took the, the majority of the time to actually design and to make sure that yeah. those were working um, and didn't interfere too much because there, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of spinning plates. And if, if you do break a rule in one direction with it, you don't want it to break the game. Yes. Um, and like you say, that yeah, that spinning plates thing is how sometimes it can feel when you've got a very complex scenario. Uh, this actually comes back to what I was saying before about there's three three bits of complexity I wanted to remove. So we've said that there's no measuring, which is a very straightforward thing. I know that that's not a brand new thing, but it's, it's a small thing that helps remove complexity. Uh, there's no no stacking modifiers. So if it's if you've got minus one to hit, it's just minus one to hit. And that's the, you only need to check yeah. for one thing. But the other one, which was kind of the most difficult one to do, but also the one that I'm really happy I pushed ahead with, is uh, no tracking, mm. which is no ongoing effects or kind of limiting as much as I can any kind of passive effects. Sure. So things like in games where you might have a unit where it says, oh, well, if all units within 12 inches of this unit get to reroll their saves or whatever. And you've got to remember that even when you're not using that unit. Mm. Or you might have a unit that gets poisoned and then you've got to remember, well, at the end of every one of their turns, now I have to apply this poison effect. But I wanted to have it that anything that happens resolves immediately. So if your character does get poisoned, if your leader is inspiring, it will happen as an active thing rather than just another passive thing to remember. And that carries across to the horror effects as well. So you, even though you've got these weird effects going on, you kind of only need to worry about the main thing that you're dealing with in the most part. There's a couple that slipped in there that are like, well, that there was no, that this one just about justified me breaking my own rule. Um, but as far as I can, I've made them like active effects. So you can just, you can just zoom in on that, what's happening right now and not have to think, well, how do all these other uh, factors affect this one thing that's happening right now? I, I mean, it comes out in the gameplay as well, um, because the, the game, I think you describe it as collaboratively competitive or cooperatively yeah. competitive. Uh, and I know in our first game that we played in the studio, well, there's a, a fair bit of back and forth between myself and Shay. When you're approaching a skirmish game, you often think it's me versus my opponent. And we played the first game like that. Uh, and neither of us were really competent enough to take down the horror as an individual um, gang. You really have to lean into the narrative side that you are on a planet, you are in a, a dim world. And, and while you potentially could deal with the, the nexus, deal with the horror that's there and deal with the opposition at the same time, you're much, much more likely to su succeed in some of your objectives if you do collaborate and, and try and uh, split the, the workload between the two, the two forces. Was that ever a, a driving thought when you were coming to do some of the, the game design with the likes of the horrors that you want people to be working across the table, not just antagonistically working against each other? Yeah, so this is, so like I said, the scenarios are kind of split into two halves. And like you say, you've got the, the conflict half is very much a straight up, it's me versus you. So it, mm -hmm. so that at, at the most basic level, it might be some kind of like take and hold objective or like a breakthrough objective. And you can just play a game like that. So you could play like one war band against the other and it's mm -hmm. just a conflict. The other half is the horror, which like I say, it's, it's very much, you've, you've got no reason to attack the other people unless you're just trying to get the glory of killing the horror yourself. It's kind of very much both warbands against the horror if you're playing with two players. Hmm. So playing with one of each, it does create this interesting dynamic that I think definitely takes some getting used to. I think if, it, if it's your first time playing the game, it will feel slightly weird the first time that you do that because everyone I've played with has been kind of like, well, I want my instinct is to just start shooting your guys because uh, I've got my guys, you've got I your guys. I want to win everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, like you say, it's kind of, you almost need that first game to just go badly to uh, to get people to realize. Wait, well, wait. We need to we need to set aside our differences a little bit yeah. to deal with this horrible thing that will otherwise just wipe us out. And um, and the campaign is built around that. Like, there's no if you fail to kill the horror, it's not like you've sort of failed and you you just have to keep banging your head against them to progress. Um, you you can go and face a different horror if you want, and you'll still get things even if you don't quite manage to kill. The horror. So like we said, the nexus is that you can destroy. Destroying mm -hmm. them will help open up some advancement for your warband. And and the warbands kind of all advance at the same rate anyway, whether they whether they whether you succeed or not. because uh, I wanted to avoid that effect of in some like skirmish campaigns, you've got things where like 
if you win every game and I lose every game after sort of six weeks of playing, so, it feels no like we're turning up. Yeah, it feels yeah. like we're in different leagues and it's like, yeah. well, we're, we're kind of operating at different tiers here. So the kind of the power level will stay the same, but the more successful you are, you'll get more options for having weird stuff. Like um, like if you kill the horror, you get to, so to use the devourer as the example, if you kill the devourer, you might be able to weaponize its digestive acid into a, an acid gun or use one of its claws as like a, a blade. Mm. Um, and same with the conflicts. If you if you succeed at that competitive objective, um, it, that will open up kind of other options for your warband as well. Um, so yeah, the, the competitive collaboration thing, I think I can see some people just deciding to play this as purely collaborative yeah. and saying, well, we just won't use the conflict. And, and you can play it solo, I should say as well. So um, yeah. you, you can just play with a horror and play it as a solo horror hunting game because um, the horrors are completely completely independent. They, they, they don't need any player uh, adjudication. The, the horrors are completely brutal. Do not go up against a horror by yourself, folks. Yeah, it, it's it's going to be a tough one. If you if you do play it solo, I think you yeah. kind of almost have to you have to take the um, take the lesser victory for the first few. If you can take out a few nexuses and then the horror um, chases off the rest of your team, that's like a that, that's something. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> take the partial win and run. Briefly popping back to the the campaign, and then in the warband side of things, um, there, there's a nice. Uh, mechanic for want of a better word um where like you're saying sometimes if you're playing other campaign based games people get injured and they go away uh, or other people get experience and they get additional skills or startups or whatever it is bump 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 uh, and they push away in the power level um whereas here when you build your your war band you're building it around a leader who doesn't cost anything mm. but they have a renowned level and the renowned level obviously stays the same because both both sides get that, which means you're you're never running, or you don't have to run, I should say, the same warband from week to week and game to game. No. You have that pool of resources and you go, well, I took a pasting in the last one. I've lost three people, um, but I've still got 25 renown. And my opponent is 25 renown, so I'm still buying from that pool. And it gives the idea that the leader is not the leader of five people sitting around a campfire, but of a larger community somewhere and it's right well this week you and you're coming with me and the equipment that we've managed to to garner either through winning in conflicts or defeating horrors um becomes like a, a communal pool of resources that can be shared around and i really like that as a, a campaign mechanic um because nobody ever feels left behind because of it yeah and it and it can go in different directions so you you could you can run it as the more traditional well i'm still gonna say i say i built five guys for my team it might be that i can only afford four, four of them to begin with in the campaign and then i save up enough to buy the extra one and then i sort of use the extra money to upgrade the equipment of my existing characters and it could be that i just keep using these but yep. what i also wanted to have was that if so again so much of this game is to encourage kit bashing if i've just kit bashed together some miniature that i really like and i mm -hmm. think well i want to use this guy tonight i can just say like well for this uh for this battle then i'm gonna sub out one of my other miniatures I was using and mm. I'm bringing in this this new guy and and again if, if you want if, if you're the kind of player that wants to really kind of build to prepare for the scenario ahead you can sort of well it's it's left a little bit open whether or not you can peek ahead at the horror mm. uh, but I, I think it's probably fine for the players to at least agree well we're going to be facing this horror which is based around so for instance one of the weirder horrors is the forsaken which mm. isn't a single horror but it's like a horde of like zombies or demons or something mm. Um, so if you're building for that scenario, you might sort of kit your team out with lots of weapons that can hit multiple targets or with lots of mobility so they don't get swamped by, uh, by the, by the thing, by the horrors. So you can, you can also tweak it to suit the scenario at hand, which, which it, it's for different players. It'll kind of scratch different itches. Yeah. And I suppose that also brings in the events tables as well, because when you're playing the campaign game, you, you generate your horror, you generate your conflict if you're using both um and then you can you can build your gang to suit but before you do that you you work out what one of the the doomed powers is influencing this um and then that adds another layer on top because before you build your gang you may discover that some of your lowest trips that the quality five dungers they they don't like the fact that they're not being fed on a regular basis or that they're always being last so you discover that if you bring them for this this next game then they only get two actions instead of the regular three in the first couple of turns or other little mis mischievous uh changes to things there as well 
Yeah. And again, they're just meant to be these little things that kind of suggest a narrative rather than presenting you with this block of text of saying, you know, reading a little bit of a, a novel. I wanted it to just be that. I mean, the classic example is one where like two of your characters get in a fight and it kind of says that you should like choose it at random. But I think yeah. if it were me, I would choose the two that it kind of makes sense that they would be having a fight. <clears throat> and, um, and yeah, and a lot of them do act as kind of um, like, like a limitation for your warband, like you said. So um, one of my favorite ones is I think it's, it's on the hunger table and it's, 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 I think, well, it's actually the top result. So this would only happen later on in the campaign, but if you let the hunger track get high enough, um, you have to sort of permanently cross off some item, some, some units from your like faction list. So you can no longer hire this type of unit. Like they're gone. Um, they've, they've gone extinct. They're, they're just there to give that little injection of a bit of a little narrative moment. Um, they, they, yeah, they can be a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I really, I really enjoy the, uh, the events tables. Uh, I'm, I'm less enjoying the ambitions and not because they're not good, but because I've made the terrible mistake of, of playing the reborn and the ambitions for your leader, they're twofold. One, they're help to build the narrative. They, they suggest what kind of a character your leader is and what they're doing. But at the end of the campaign, they're also used as, as an extra form of resource for the prestige gained from their ambitions. Mm -hmm. Um, and that I thought was a fascinating concept even if I don't want to have to go and touch three different horrors ever. Uh, yeah. And they, they, they were, again, I wanted to have these little, I wanted to have these little rewards, but I didn't want, I didn't want to have anything that like we said before felt like a very standard experience point thing where it's like, this yeah. is going to make you better. So do this. So the, yeah, the ambitions, they come into play later on in the, if you get to like the final battle of the campaign, the amount of ambitions that you fulfilled will give you like maybe some extra stuff in that final battle. But I think as much as anything else, when I've the, the when I played the this with people, I think they just like having a list of things to try and check off. It's like extra mm. little challenges to try and do, and some of them are very very it's difficult and very kind of petty as well. Like, why, why little, do you want to do like, this? <laughs> nothing little about any of my challenges; they're all remarkable. Uh, but even in there, and I mean, and this one, uh, I was having a, a joke with Shay about it. Um, uh, I think it says permanently retire five of your miniatures. So it's not five of your gang members. It's like five of you've, you've kept past, you've spent time, you've made these miniatures, you've painted the miniatures. And it's like, do you really want to, do you want to take off another little ambition? Then those guys, they just go away. You're not bringing them back. Go make some That's more. <laughs> and I love that because I mean, at, at no point does anybody go, I need eight models and I will make eight models maximum. And I, I shall never make another model for this game. Uh, that's that game done. You go, I need eight models, you say, but I'm probably only going to use five, but I'll probably start with 16 and go from there because I want options. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and quirky, quirky things like that, that aren't set specifically within the doomed world. Yeah. But sort of, you know, play around a bit more with um with the the war band that you're creating uh, mm -hmm. i really enjoy i just wish there were more people were forced to retire the models from the inheritor court just saying <laughs> not that i've been getting very badly bruised by shay but i'm just i see <laughs> yeah, yeah just one of those things uh, but yeah it's it's a fascinating fascinating game is there any other little nuggets that you particularly fond of within the, the doomed because i think we've mm. covered Nice. Yeah, one of the things that took a long time to really settle on was the the behavior of the the way that the horrors behaved. Mm. So I originally had a system where um the basically if you're playing with two players, um you would kind of stand a random chance of who controlled the, the horror for the turn. So mm -hmm. if I took control of the horror, obviously I'm going to like send it over towards your guys. And then if you get it, you'll you'll do the same to me. But that that felt a little bit too felt silly because you, you get these silly situations where the horror is like running back and forth between the sides of the board. Yeah. Um, so I, sat, I, I, I was sort of resistant against the idea of having a kind of AI in there originally because I thought, well, that, that can be, they can be quite complex in yeah. some systems where you have an AI. Um, but I eventually got it narrowed down to like a three, three steps priority. So if they'll attack, they can. If they can't attack, they move towards the nearest visible target. If there's no visible targets, they sniff out the nearest target regardless and move towards them. And that's it. Um, so, but with that, I, I thought, well, I still want the horrors to act differently. So I want the devourer to act differently to the, the forsaken because mm -hmm. they're, they're different creatures. Um, so the, the two things that really enabled that were the, there's a response table where at the end of every round, uh, the horror will do something weird. So you roll a D6 
and the horrible do one of six things that are kind of like its special move if you like mm-hmm. um and so yeah the, the doom hand is a really weird one it's a big it, hand it is um so it can kind of randomly pop pop out and pop up somewhere else and sort of appear next to you and grab you um the but other ones might have things where they're like their minions are shuffling around and some might have ones where they're kind of they're changing the nature of the horror itself mm-hmm. um so yeah the response table was really fun and using that in combination with the nexus but the, the effects yeah. where when you destroy each nexus in turn the the horrible change as the battle goes on yeah um, uh, so for the devourer i think i think it just gets worse doesn't it with the devourer so the, the devourer remember. gets much worse the devourer gets angrier the more attacks of nexuses that you destroy because uh, yeah yeah because there is there's of- meat piles yeah Every Nexus effect is a terrible, frightening thing. The Doom Hand was a really interesting one for me because obviously you have the response at the end of the turn, but also with the Doom Hand, um, I believe whenever he uh, kills a character, you roll on the response table. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So he's kind of there to like pop, pop away and appear where you least want him to appear. Yeah. So, so well, and that because, um, because at the end of every unit's activation, you then activate an unbound monster. Uh, when you've only got two on the table and your opponent has just thrown the doom hand into your back line and killed one of your, your figures and they're expecting the uh, the doom hand then to stay there and then just plow through you as you run screaming in terror. Uh, and then we looked at it and went, oh, well, they actually have to roll on the response table and the response table all of a sudden zipped it to another corner of the board right in front of his deployment zone. Nice. And those... <laughs> All of a sudden, all bets are off. You don't know. You don't know what to do or where to go. And yeah. The last thing you want to do is be caught in the corner by something like that. And one of the kind of compromises with the old system was, like, like you've said, after after you've moved one of your units, uh, you you choose one of the unbound units to move. So usually there will be the horror and mm. a, a, two or three, four minions on the board. Um, so you can still do the thing where I'm going to choose this horror now because at at this moment he's the horror is closer to you so i'm going to choose that so you can still mess with your opponent indirectly um but it's not quite as fun as i'm going to take control of this this horror we were playing the first few games on a a two by two and then we expanded out to a a three by three Mm. um but because the game plays in such a compact dense little table even even if they have thrown uh, one of the unbound creatures against you. Your opponent thinks that uh, it's it's all going beautifully for them. It doesn't take much for them to get around the table and, no. <laughs> and start chewing into other people that they weren't expecting it to as well. It's it's very claustrophobic, shall we say, set up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And there's um, so yeah, I wanted it to feel like you were fighting a boss monster essentially. Um, one of the inspirations is a game that I've not actually played through, but I've I've, I've read a large chunk of it. Is a Kingdom Death Monster, hmm. and in that game, that's like super complex. There's these like decks for each monster, and like they're yeah. they're behaving in very um, in very unique ways. But there's a lot of mechanics that go along with it. So I wanted to capture some of that feeling without having to have all of that paraphernalia uh, used to kind of to run the monster. Yeah, I, I think it's succeeded in spades. It has to be said from the. The short amount of time we've had to be playing around with it, um, the, the the horrors are truly horrifying, and the the sooner I don't have to see them anymore coming towards me, gribbling away, the better. Uh, it's been an absolute joy uh, to talk to you. Uh, oh, thank and you. Over this past week, play the game as well. Uh, if people want to keep tabs on what you're up to, uh, your blog is Bastionland. Yeah, bastionland.com, where you can read about the RPGs I've made as well. And there's a regular regular blog on there talking about game design stuff. And um, yeah, uh, down the sidebar, there's links to uh, Patreon, Substack, Discord, all those things, YouTube, etc., that you would expect to see. Fantastic stuff. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope people at home have been enjoying the Doomed Week. And if you haven't seen the gameplay yet, go and see how I managed to uh, absolutely ruin every dice roll I possibly could. It's been a lot of fun losing so horribly to Shay. Uh, Until next time, folks, bye-bye. Comment on the Doomed Week videos for your chance to win the rulebook. We will choose three winners. One from the YouTube comments, one from OnTabletop.com, and our Cult of Games members get an extra chance to win. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.